Hello, everyone, and welcome to Weekly Manga Recap. It is July the 5th of 2018. I am Nick. This is Chris. It is no longer America's birthday, and thank God, because I fucking hated it. So, that's, uh... I actually, I'll actually probably have a little story to tell you sometime, but I'm not going to repeat it here about okay. what happened. But, uh... Yay! I have a small story. Okay. It's very tiny. So... I stayed up very late last night because I'm an irresponsible person with my life. And I was very, very tired when I was finally going to bed. And I had just actually been staying up watching something that was spooky, Nick. So I was in a little bit of a creepy mood. So I go upstairs. And you know my beautiful, wonderful dog, Scotia. She's a white dog. She's part pit. So she's a little tall. She stands, like, straight up. Um, and the way my house is set up is that, like, the basement feeds into, like, a side room that leads into the living room itself... And then for the living room, there's, like, a long hallway that then leads to all, like, the personal rooms in the bathroom. So Scotia generally sleeps in the living room, either on her bed or the couch. Because it's, like, 2 o'clock in the morning, I usually don't, like, do anything with her when she's, like, already asleep. It's not like going to, like, rub her head and anything like that. It just feels, like, disruptive. So I get out of, I go upstairs, I go through the living room, don't notice her, but generally don't. Go into the hallway, and Scotia's standing straight up at the end of the hallway... And in my haze of tiredness, I just see, like, a figure about half my height, like, more than half my height in white standing at the end of the hallway. And I nearly lost my shit. I, I was like, oh, God, a specter's come for me. I'm going to have to fight this ghost. I, I didn't know what to think. Then I realized it was my dog, and I got angry. He's like, get out of the hallway. <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you staying in the hallway, you terrifying dog? And she did. That's my short story, Nick. I thought my dog was a ghost for a while. Yay! Ghost dog. Not nearly that cool. Ghost dog. People are saying you can't punch ghosts, but I was going to try. Uh, you just need to believe in yourself. I also need to use foresight first, and then it's susceptible to normal and fighting type attacks. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, I, I made it a Pokemon reference. Well, Chris. Uh, so things are going to be a little weird this week. How so, uh, Nick? Are we doing our show in wacky hats? Well, I don't have a wacky hat. You can. I do. Okay, go right ahead, man. But uh, what I was going to refer to was that does not look like it was designed to even fit on your head, let alone over your headphones. Yeah, it works now. All right. So um, last week we had so you know some series missing, but we got the inclusion of you know. Jumpstart. We got a new series called Eden Zero, which it looks like we're, we're probably just going to pick it up. Um, this week, uh, Crunchyroll, uh, up until a couple of hours ago, was saying that they were going to post the new chapters this week about 30 minutes into this recording, which meant that we were going to have to do live reads. Now they're not even advertising that. So. Oh, no. <laughs> it's good to know that they're as reliable as ever when it comes to their posting stuff up on time. So so we might not have any Eden Zero or uh, Seven Deadly Sins. Or Seven Deadly Sins. I will make sure to keep on checking, but they're no longer even... Say, they even said, like, the next Simulpub will be, you know, at this time, and they're not even putting that up there right now. Uh, so. Mine still says 17 minutes for Eden Zero. Oh, okay. Gr uh, now, granted, I didn't sure. refresh, so... It may have changed since then. So there you go. Um, maybe we'll be able to actually read the chapters. Maybe not, which means that things are going to be a little chaotic, uh, possibly. But we do have wacky hats. We do have wacky hats. Mine's invisible. That's how wacky it is. That's a very silly hat. Yeah. I mean, why would you even bother? <laughs> Give it up. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh, alright <laughs> just, just talk about manga My Hero Academia number 189 why he gets back up get up it's so, a chapter about the Undertaker Yeah, they're talking about his, uh, his iconic like thump thing he does it's like if if uh well no I mean, he's he's fire powered so he's more like Kane sitting up. I guess Kane's done the sit up before, yeah. He's done the sit up. A few he times, does. Yeah. He doesn't have the Brock Lesnar laugh gif though. So no, he does not. I still don't understand what he was going for. 
<laughs> well, Brock laughed in his face, and so he was like, <laughs> which like, is so weird for the Undertaker. You think he would just be? You think he would just try and kill him for mocking him? As like, opposed to just again, like, <laughs> he's a zombie wizard, so you assumed a zombie wizard wouldn't resort to like. Yeah, no, you think we're doing a man. Like, are you doing, like, the, the old school, like, kid tactic of, like, saying what you said in a shitty voice? Yeah, you know, that kind of behavior is completely out of out of character for a zombie wizard, cowboy, biker, is his cult leader. Di- <laughs> different characters at that point, Nick. American Badass Taker and uh, Undertaker Taker are two different characters. Anyway. So, we pick up where we left off in the last chapter with Endeavor getting his ass handed to him by the new special Nomu while meanwhile Hawks was a safe distance away fighting the weak ones and protecting people Uh, and we pick up with Hawks just kind of you know talking to himself a little bit uh, and they're like oh we've got things handled here you know uh, and uh, we cut over to where the Nomu is and uh, it's demanding, you know, more competition, more victims, uh, stronger opponents to fight because Endeavor is not looking so hot. And of course, which should arrive at that time, but a news chopper to uh, broadcast the proceedings. Um, and they make deliberate comparisons to it's just like, you know, three months ago when uh, All Might was uh, fighting with uh, All for One. But at that moment, uh, Endeavor suddenly, he doesn't spring up, he launches himself up using his fire in order to get up off of his back. And he tries to launch another one of his flame fist attacks at the Nomu, but it just kind of grabs him with an appendage and throws him into, into a building. And it it's like, ah, stronger. Uh, people are freaking out because it looks like the Nomu is going to just break everything Uh we then get to see a bunch of different people reacting to the battles that unfolds, including uh, Endeavor's kids uh, who have just gotten done visiting their mom. You can't be uh, watching that on a laptop uh, while you're driving, though. You, uh, you're you going to use your data if you do that. Might have a hot they, spot. Maybe, maybe they're, maybe they're uh, stealing Wi-Fi. Maybe there's Bluetooth connection in the in the taxi. That could be the taxi driver's quirk. Hotspot. Hot <laughs> oh spot. my god! Hot Be spot. the most popular hero ever. <laughs> Free Wi-Fi for all. Number one hero. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just for pure convenience' sake. <laughs> we don't just com- freaking uh, DSL providers would collapse. <laughs> or. They're not watching it live, and this is like a time delusion thing. They're watching it later, and somebody's like, "Are you okay?" Your dad is like, "Shh, shh, shh! Don't spoil it. We're only part of the way through." Don't you want to have like up to date information about? They're like, you- he may not live long in the hospital. They're like, spoilers! Come on, we're almost done. Damn it! I have to wait for part four to be uploaded to YouTube. <laughs> well, Pornhub. That's actually where I get it from. You can find some interesting things on Pornhub. It's not just about the sexy. There's really good 360 no scope compilations on there. <laughs> so, um, Natsu uh, is confused because, like, he's he's crazy. He should he shouldn't be trying to keep fighting. He should be trying to retreat. He should try and wait for backup. Uh, and his sister says, you know, that's not what he does. Just because you understand something doesn't mean you'll accept it. He never gave up. And in fact, giving up is what he's worst at. He is a stubborn boy. Uh, Some people are freaking out in the crowd as they're watching the Nobu jumping around from building to building. Uh, And one of them says, without a symbol, this is society without a symbol of peace. And everyone's launched into a panic. Uh, But someone in the crowd's like, hey, stop saying that crap. Open your eyes before you spout off on TV at a time like this. Look, those are those flames are still rising up. Endeavor's alive and fighting, so don't give up just because the other guy's gone. There's still a dude out there risking it all for us. <laughs> I wish there had been a better word than dude. <laughs> like, it only could have been better if he was like, There's still a bra out there! There's still a homie out there! <laughs> <laughs> we got Our homies fighting for us! And then you just do it. Then you just cast it as as uh, Vin Diesel. He's like, 
Our homie is still out there. He's fighting for us. There's still a Duderino out there risking it all for us. <laughs> Our dude ball's out there and he needs us to support him. And it's the guy that was admiring Endeavor in the crowd earlier. The one that he, that said that Endeavor was acting out of character by being nice to him. So, a true fan, you know. He, he'll uh, hate on you when he doesn't like what you're doing, but then if anyone else talks shit, I'll defend you. I don't know if that's a great fan. <laughs> That's what that's what that's what a real fan does, Chris. <laughs> a real I, asshole. I don't know if this guy's supposed to be a caricature of a great fan. <laughs> last week, right. last week he right. sounded like kind of like a toxic fan, but he was just like, I liked Endeavor better when there weren't so many women in it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mixed it up with something else. I'm going to remake Endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Endeavor, but instead of fire, it's penises. <laughs> there Endeavor. we go. Now it's Endeavor. straight. Endeavor was better when he wasn't trying to be nice to his wife when he was exploiting her to give him a perfect genetically engineered child. <laughs> That's when Endeavor was cool. <laughs> oh, man. Time to make the defeminized Endeavor cut. <laughs> it's just Endeavor constantly putting his wife in the asylum. <laughs> it's just a blue circle over his wife's head anytime he's talking to her. What, she's Christian? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, God. What the fuck was he thinking? Anyway, so uh, Endeavor continues to try and fight, and the and the Noma is like, "Why you can also regenerate?" And it was like, "Nope, <laughs> I'm just trying to fight you on force of will before my body explodes into a million pieces." Um, and he's just refusing to go down. He's talking to himself to hype himself up. It's like, I've just got to keep on pushing my body forward with my own firepower. And it's only thanks to the pain that I'm even conscious. But you think I'm beat? This eye is giving out. But I still see victory up ahead. Uh, and he's refusing to even f to fall over at this point. Uh, Hawks comes in to help out uh, Endeavor and... Uh, he strikes at Nomu from the side to distract it, and he thinks to himself, you know, I don't have a lot of punch, but they make up for it with speed. I've been watching it this whole time, and I get it. There was nobody else out there really trying to surpass him. Only you. You were the one working to surpass him. So, he basically just like, all right. Actually, God, where the fuck is that? Oh, my God. Hang on. Let me zoom in here a bit. Oh, we get to see a little bit of Baby Hawks in this uh, panel here from when Endeavor was young. Huzzah! Hmm. Okay. Well, he, I, I, got, I got confused because there's someone next to him who looks basically exactly like he currently looks. But Endeavor doesn't have the flame beard and everything, so this is clear from a long time ago. So, uh, so and Hawks has decided, like, okay, I'm going to help you out here and be launches his feathers towards Endeavor. They attach to his back and form wings and keep help him to, to speed forward. And he's like, I'll push you forward, number one, as Endeavor launches forward with flaming wings to punch the Nobu in the head. It's a cool visual. So this was a connecting chapter uh -huh. to a chapter we have to wait two weeks for. <laughs> I like this chapter. I mean, I like the visual at the end. That's like such it's almost too metal where it's like a screaming monster as a flaming angel, essentially, like run like flies forward with a rocket punch. Like it's almost too cool in its own way. So I dig it for that. And I also I, I like showing essentially the stuff that did make Endeavor special, I guess, is the best way I could kind of put it that when everyone else was complacent with the idea of oh, yeah. being number one, he was the one person trying to surpass yeah. him. I like that visual that they have there too. Everyone's on the other side of this huge chasm between them and all mine. They're just like, yeah, you go get him and endeavor me. And I was just like, I'll cross it with this plank. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's like a really short plank too, to show that he never was going to get across, but he's, he's just like, he's like, I'm doing something. <laughs> I will maybe if I get another rock <laughs> and another plank. A really big rock though. It was a big rock. I dug it though. I, I'm looking forward to seeing how this fight kind of comes to its conclusion. 
I like it, but I do kind of, I don't know, I, I think it's kind of a bummer to leave off on this note. Like, and now you have to wait a week because it's like, it's not, it wasn't a strong enough impact for me to be like, oh, I can't wait. And I'm just like, oh, okay, I'll wait two weeks for this. Um, I think that if you're going to, you know, announce like, we're going to be off next week that, and you're going to leave it on a cliffhanger like that, you should really hit, hit it hard. I... Like, if we had gone off... If we got if we had gotten a break after last week, that would have been a lot more powerful. I think it would be. I'm I'm of the mindset though of like, and hopefully it's a lesson they've learned from Oda of like, and honestly, um, Ashihara, where it's like, for the love of God, give your artist breaks. Like, I'm hoping that they're like, maybe let's just make it a thing where you get more frequent breaks because although it could be frustrating as a reader. Uh, I'd be much less frustrated if my artists, like, if I know that they aren't constantly under, like, the worst working conditions possible to produce that. So, I'm fine with it. Yeah, and also, you know, at this point, I think Horikoshi is one of their top commodities that they want to keep him oh, yeah. well-rested. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so, let's move on here to uh, Food Wars. Shokugeki no Soma. Soma and Megami's Hot Springs Case Files File 05 Megami Tadakoro's Hospitality. It's it's not going to last much longer, Chris. They're, they're going to run out of these case files, and then they're going to have to drop that long title, uh, that long title championship back to We Never Learn. He's just going to hold on to it for another, you know, six months of darkness. <laughs> You're just like, God damn it, I can't believe Alexa Bliss. I mean, uh, <laughs> we never learned as champion again. <laughs> I'm kidding. Alexa Bliss is the best champion. This is great. I do know if some people are fucking hate, sick of her being champion, but yeah. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> I sat through like four years of Triple I H sat champion. Through, I, I, sat, I sat through Nikki, Nikki Bella breaking AJ Lee's title reign. You, can, you guys can fuck off. <laughs> With her like eight title defenses in 10 months or some bullshit. Wasn't it like the title disappeared off television for a while, but then eventually came back and like, I guess that streak's still intact. <laughs> It'd be oh, like man. if Hornswoggle showed up with the Cruiserweight title right I'm now. still champion! <laughs> and everyone's like, wait, what? <laughs> Cedric Alexander, you never beat me. I'm the legitimate. <laughs> Holy shit, they need to do this feud. Cedric just like picks him up and places him on the ground and steps on him as a they'd, done. They'd have a five star match. It's two or five live. Apparently. <laughs> or rather, he right. tries to pick him up, but Hornswoggle is just the most. How do you even gain purchase on his weird round body? <laughs> we're making a lot of wrestling references. This episode, well, Nick, so. that's because we're a wrestling podcast that occasionally talks about manga. About manga. We, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the opposite did occasionally happen on. Uh, Integral Wrestling Chronicles, admittedly. <clears throat> so, the dish that Megami has made for the king, whatever the fuck his name is, uh, is a kid's meal. Uh, it's got these decorative uh, little things in it. There's, you know, a little flag in there. You know, very festive appearance. Little stars and mm. spirals. And uh, the... Uh, woman in charge of the inn is like, what, miss? What You said you're going to make a dish with a flavor only our inn could provide. And she's like, huh? Yeah, yeah, I did. And the chef is like, well, she did use ingredients that we have on hand, but why the hell did she make a kid's curry thing? And the king is like, ha, oh, you're just begging to be my slaves. Uh, and Megan was like, what? Just enjoy it. Eat it. Mm. So he takes a bite. And immediately he's transported to like a creek somewhere, uh, like a a creek in the middle of the uh, forest clearing. And uh, so everyone is like, "Oh, oh, let me try a bit of that." And the the chef and the innkeeper uh, take try it and like, "Oh, it's so warming." And Megumi starts to explain, "Oh yeah, I use this. I use these shrimp and stuff." And I like how so they have these you know like transported to a pass a, a peaceful. Pl- place where everything is wonderful and harmonious and someone's just like it's good <laughs> someone got no fucking experience out of it he's like hey it's not bad <laughs> can I have some popcorn now <laughs> so uh, they agree it's like, yeah it's, this, is, this is really good Yeah, you used our ingredients in a really creative way uh, and the chef's like yeah this is delicious 
But I'm confused, though. That guy, why is he having a much stronger reaction than any of us? What, what's going on? And the guy says, like, oh, this looks like curry, but it ain't. It's gumbo. It tastes just like him. Oh, well, hold on, Nick. If it's gumbo, if and we, are, we ought to get all sell some New Orleans accent here going on now. It's going to be a gumbo family dish now. So, I'm not going to do that, though, because I'm just going to end up slurring most of my lines. Just a, I damn on gum, coincidence, I'm on delivery. <laughs> all you have to do is do, like, Southern Weirdo, which, as I found out, is essentially just doing Bray Wyatt. <laughs> do. I'm a Southern Weirdo. <laughs> so... The guy says, says uh, this is some sort of magic trick, Mishimato Nadeshiko. <laughs> uh, and she, Megumi says, like, well, you know, there's a certain lilt to how you pronounce your words. And I thought it sounded very similar to the lyrical accent unique to that area. And Megumi says, like, well, you know, I'm, I'm the same way. You know, if I'm not paying attention to myself, then you know, my accent slips out, too, which I like that little detail. It's, that's why she was able to catch it. Um, and so she says, like, you know, I knew you were American, but from that, I figured you were probably from this particular region. They that you, that you probably had a lot of gumbo growing up. And <laughs> I like that after she has that tall speech, then they're like, wow, amazing. I can't believe you did that. She's like, oh, I'm right. Yay. <laughs> um, and the king demands, how did she figure this, that, that out? And Megami says, well, I've just been doing some studying. And we get an explanation that since she earned her seat on the Council of Ten, she's been taking advantage of that to fucking travel everywhere and just immerse herself in a, in the, in a bunch of different cultures, go to many different regions, uh, speak with a lot of different people and just learn what it is like to live and thrive there. I have no idea how she could have gone to so many places in like three months, but good on her. <laughs> I guess. I mean, they're second years, right? So there would be like a break in school for a couple months, right? I don't know. Four, maybe it was six months. I think that might've passed in between this. But she's gone to, like, everywhere, though. Like, she's gone to some place in the north. She's been to, like, Egypt, to a tropical island, to clearly somewhere in Central or South America, uh, to France. So she's been everywhere. Anyway. I can't stop hearing the Rihanna song right now. I can't. I don't want to. I don't know what that song is. The one that's just like, I've been everywhere, man. Da, 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 da. A song. Isn't it? No. So, okay. She might have covered it, but that's not a Rihanna song. I've been everywhere, Rihanna. Yeah, she Johnny Cash. Well, Johnny Cash did it, but I'm talking about the fucking one that's been current. Like, the one that's... The, the one where she's like, Where have you been all my life? You know the song. Once you hear it, you won't stop. I don't know the song because you, I don't listen 100% to hundred percent you've heard it. I, I, I refuse to believe you have it. Guarantee you I have not because I don't <sighs> listen to pop music in general. Anyway, so as Megan me explains, because she went to manage to go to all these different places, uh, she experienced the taste of home special to each place and incorporated it into her own cooking so that she could improve as a chef. Which that's a very logical uh, way of explaining how Megami got good because that makes sense for what her specialty is and also I like that she just okay well I'm on the council of 10 I might as well actually you know take advantage of that and she actually jumped on the opportunity and was just like okay we did all this stuff and now she's awesome so uh, Megami concludes from all this that she thinks that what this guy has actually been trying to accomplish uh, was not to be pampered and treated like a king, but, you know, if that kind of luxury were all you wanted, then you wouldn't have actually come out here. I think that what you really wanted, or rather, I know what you wanted, is a, is a warm, gentle hug. Aww. And then things get weird. <laughs> so the king is like, I can't deny it. This girl, this flavor, 
I just can't say no. It's mellow and comforting while at the same time spicy and strict. She's right. What I really wanted was something like this gumbo. Something that wraps the infant in me, oh no, up in a warm, welcoming hug. A hospitality just like mom's. Yeah, this flavor. This is a mom's cooking. And then we get a visual of him in a fucking baby onesie being fed by Megami. Hand fed by him. By her. This is the creepiest fetish in Food Wars yet, okay? Just... I'll be honest. This one didn't even bother me. It's the end where she's like, Yeah, you've been a bad boy. <laughs> and I'm just like, that's creepy. <laughs> like, it's I so understand weird. he can have the impression that you're like a mother and this is a comforting thing for him. But it's much weirder when you're playing into it in actuality with your speech and tone. This isn't like, you know, the ones where they like hinted at it. it's like, oh, you know, S&M. And it was like, but we can't actually do the S&M because, you know, then that would make it, you know, at a higher rating and stuff like that. But this is literally just infant play. Like, th- it just is. So it's just like, it's extra creepy to see it like played out to this extent. It's like, oh, stop it. Get get Hero in here with his foot fetish to normalize things for a bit. <laughs> I'm not trying to kink shame. I just think that it's really weird to see it pushed out to this extent and portrayed to this extent. It sounds like you're kink shaming. Fine, I am. <laughs> That's all we want. I think it's weird, okay? I'm sorry. That's fair. There's a lot of them out there. You can find them weird. It's if it enough. says it for you, fine. I just th- it's just weird that I'm reading, you know, my freaking shonen jump and all of a sudden it's like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> This could have. I guess I should be used to it, considering that the artist is a freaking hentai dojin artist formally. So. This could have been significantly weirder, though. So I will applaud it for that. Like this could have been one a female character, in which case she probably would have been less clothed. So and it could have been drawn in a more sexual manner. It's fine, Nick. This is like. Th- th- this is like spicy like maybe like hot on the scale but it's it's not el fuego <laughs> it's just so <laughs> weird i'm sorry oh man what do you think of like the actual important thing in this chapter though like a megami's growth as a as a chef i mean look i i'm always glad that megami is is doing something and achieving something but I, i'll be honest I, I wish this was like an actual Shokugeki and there were judges and they evaluated her cooking against someone else's. I know Megumi's cooking has been good for a while. Every person she's ever been beaten by has basically said like, oh, she's much better than I thought. So in this situation where it's not a direct one for one comparison, hearing like, oh, she's really good. It's, it's OK. And like, I like the idea of seeing like, oh, she's kind of like Rindo and that she traveled the world and she's learned all these different things. Like, I like that thing. But I'm, I'm still waiting on an actual Shokugeki for her to prove her mm. stuff in. Show her metal in combat, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I think that this one just took me extra off guard because it just... Honestly I, sh- honestly, I should be used to it at this point. Just, like, random shit getting thrown in w- whenever uh, Soma is involved. Like, uh, you know, the little girls dressed as teddy bear, lawn- sexy teddy bears. Because uh-huh. they got that honey. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. Uh, someone's saying that the Crunchyroll chapters are out. No, they're not. Yep. <laughs> I, I don't see them. Uh, I mean, I I don't know. Try reloading. I definitely have it right now. I Okay. Uh, if you are, wanna... are we doing Eden Zero now? I'm, I forget when I, we I... put it in the, the recap. <laughs> well, things kind of got thrown off because I didn't actually like schedule anything. But I think that you, now is a good place for Eden Zero. All right. <sighs> Bear with me, guys, because this is... Live 50... reading! This is also a 50-fucking-page chapter, so there's a lot to read okay. here. So, we see the dragon from last week opening it up, and it looks as though... Uh, or rather, it is the dragon from last week. Uh, and the dragon is 
I don't know if the dragon's talking. I think it's actually this giant space bitch that we see in this that's talking. Whereas you see, the boy has begun his journey. What will he bring to our cosmos? Uh, will he become the hero of legend or will he re- uh, wreck insurmountable havoc as a demon king? Now your adventure begins. Let your own feet carry you forward. And it's a giant woman floating in a space throne. Uh, essentially hot Thanos, I guess. That's that's a good way of describing her, yeah. I managed to get it to work by just freaking changing the chapter in the address bar because I couldn't find a link. So we open up with Shiki, and I believe he's looking at what the future version of televisions are. Future internet. Oh, actually, th- this is the future YouTube because he's talking about all these boxy mm. square things, and in the next page... Uh, we see the blue cat channel uh, where they're they're doing meow meow poses and things like that. And she's upset because he's trying to copy her. Fair enough. Well, he does it poorly, too. He's like, me wow, me wow. Happy's also like, was he trying to copy us? So maybe that was just him being like, meow, meow, or something like that. I don't know. Uh, so apparently... <laughs> They're not called YouTubers here. That'd be weird. They're called B-Cubers. <laughs> well, fuck you. B-Cubers can eat my nuts. <laughs> you couldn't have come up with anything more creative than B-Cubers. What do you think the B stands for, even? Maybe there was an A-Cube and it just got covered in fucking porn. So they, had to, they had to flee to a new <laughs> All right, it's a B-Cube. We're going to have stricter <laughs> guidelines now. This one's been, take, this one's been taken over by, by alt-right Nazis and stuff. But, you know, <laughs> but at least we don't have porn. Uh, so, yeah, they're called B-Cubers and they make what They're essentially YouTubers. That's what she's ex- uh, describing. He tries to look under her skirt, but apparently the angle is anatomically great. Why don't they just say VR? Because that's essentially what she's saying. They get captured a static image. So, I don't know. He, he, he can't see up her under her, her fucking skirt. So, their goal is to go to planets and have fun videos. And they were thinking that when they get to Blue Garden, they're going to register him as an adventurer. And I guess adventurers are people who get passports that can go to all sorts of different kinds of planets. And she says, since you're such a good fighter, how about you be our bodyguard for a while? And he's like, yep, I'm in. So they make it to the planet of adventurers Blue Garden. And from space, it kind of just looks like like, a, a swirling vortex of something. Maybe that's clouds, and when you break through, you can see the city itself. Well, you get uh, to see what the what it is in the next page, Chris. Yeah, we see what it, I'm saying from space. It doesn't look like there's an actual planet there. It just looks like mm-hmm. liquid clouds moving about. So we see Blue Garden in a giant two-page spread, and Shiki says, "Whoa, humans are everywhere! I'm gonna go touch them." And Rebecca, I had to fucking remember what her name was. Yeah, I know. Punches him in the face and says, no. And he's like, can I be friends with everybody here? And she's like, that's a nice thought. But while there are good people, there are also bad people. Not to mention people generally ignore anyone they don't know. I like she put on fucking glasses for this. Like she was trying to sound like she was a scientist explaining this to somebody. Where she's just like. I think she was wearing them in the panel before that when she punches him. She is, but the way, like, she wasn't always normally wearing glasses, so it feels like one of those things where she's just like, that's a nice thought, but there are bad people and good people, and sometimes people don't know other people. <laughs> just like, thanks, Professor Stupid. Uh, oh, and she says, he asked why she's wearing glasses, she says, I am technically a digital influencer, I'm kind of famous. So she's like a, like a stereotype, ge- like, gamer girl, essentially. <laughs> I don't know what A little bit, doing. yeah. A <laughs> little bit. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Uh, someone tries to capture Happy. Huh. For the plant X seed. And uh, I guess he's going to try to sell him. He says, I can get a tidy sum for this guy. And he disappears in a cloud of smoke. And Shiki's angry because someone stole his friend. They're a friend stealer. And he goes to try to get him. And Rebecca's very shocked, so she has a flashback to when she met Happy, and it looks like they were both alone. And uh, hungry. Yes, very hungry. Their their stomachs were gurgling. So Shiki starts running across the side of a building, just like... <laughs> the only way to travel, yeah. Exactly. 
And he has this whole chase thing. Uh, he sees a woman that has a different face. He <laughs> calls the woman fat. Uh, I like I like how he, his his shorthand for people is like woman with a different face from Rebecca. Ah, oh, you look like Grandpa. Ah, oh, you're skinny. You're a cat. <laughs> Man, you're skinny. Woman, you're huge. People are really different. <laughs> I've understood the now gamut I, of humans. Now I know. He said while running along the side <laughs> of the fucking building. <laughs> And uh, he recalls uh, Rebecca's earlier words about good and bad people. And he's like, you are a bad person. And uh, he grabs onto the bike and I believe increases gravity or basically forces on this guy and brings his, his flying motorcycle bike thing down to the ground. And uh, he hasn't been able to get Happy out. Happy's still stuck up in the thing. And the guy pulls out a gun. He says, this ain't a show, punks. Happy. What? Somebody gave a weird name to it? And uh, uh, Happy says, that's not weird. It's the name Rebecca gave me. And we go we go back to our flashback to when Rebecca was a kid. She says, oh, you have a name? He says, I don't have one. So she says, I'll give you one then. You make me happy to finally have a friend. So your name is Happy. And he goes, Happy! It's about as imaginative as I would expect a tired, delirious seven-year-old to have. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, so then a big dude comes up, and he's like, Whoa, 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 what's all this yelling about? Oi, 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 oi. Oh, oh, I'm the brace coil, oh, I am. Uh, and she, he says, What, bro? So this guy's a human? Whoa, he's huge. And the guy says, Hey, you know, I got this cat. So the, the big gang leader's like, Cool, we'll get a lot of money for him. Ne pa 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 Okay. <laughs> I know it's become a thing to give people weird laughs, like, in the past 30 years. But try and imagine someone actually laughing like that. Like, (laughs) okay, come on. That doesn't sound natural. That's put on. (laughs) I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps like the way Oda does it. This is a pun of some kind based on this guy. I don't know. I don't know what Nipa would be, but let's assume so. And that it's not just a shitty thing. All right. So Rebecca's like, give Happy back. And uh, they're all like, whoa, check out this babe. Whoa, she's one of those bee cubers. And I'm like, bullshit. <laughs> There's no chance. If this is a galaxy of YouTubers, there is no way you would know who the fuck a random YouTuber is <laughs> in real life. Obviously, Chris, she's the only B-Cuber who's caught on to the mass appeal of, uh, you know, sex appeal. Yeah, obviously. The only one who considered it. And they, didn't they say she's not even that popular yet? Like, she doesn't have a million subscribers yet? Rebecca Rebecca claimed that she was kind of famous, and Happy was like, but we don't really get that many views. So, <laughs> Well, her goal was to get a million subscribers, and a million's right. not that unheard of in today, like, in just the world. This is there a are people galaxy. with a million subscribers today. There's, yeah. there's, there's hundreds of people with a million subscribers. Like, that's that's a, a, an attainable goal for somebody who's popular on this platform. This right. platform being YouTube. So this is a galaxy of people they don't have that, but he knows her. I don't know. Whatever. I don't care. I can't I can't I can't nitpick this. Uh they say cats for exceed go for a lot of money, so it'd be a ways to beat a pet for a couple kids. And uh, they're like, Happy's my friend, yeah. And they're like, look at the little babies acting tough. Little babies. And Rebecca throws out a threat, says says, if you so much as scratch happy, I'll make you pay. And we get a montage of glimpses of them as kids. Uh and then like one where in her bed where she's saying, Why are you all alone, happy? And he says, I don't know. I think I was abandoned. What about you? I think I was too. But I'm not lonely. Not one bit, because I found you. And there's a little beautiful heart bubble thing that says let's never leave each other okay sure we'll be together forever so happy's gonna die at the end of this chapter (laughs) that's that's what all my years of of knowledge has told me no no no. he's not one of her parents so you don't know (laughs) uh so shiki says get back all right um we'll see how this goes he uses his uh ether flow I think. Right. I can't remember the name 100%. Uh, and he starts sliding across the ground. He starts, like, knocking people up and, like, blasting around. Ether gear. Not ether flow. Ether gear. Uh, he starts knocking people away. And uh, the two thugs who we've actually seen talking are like, That's ether gear! Whoa! But that's from the Dark Ages! 
But then the crazy big guy's like, he just pulls out a fucking Gatling gun from nowhere. Where the fuck did that come from? Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, he's just like, ah, there we go. <laughs> I always tuck it in my anus for good measure. <laughs> Uh, he starts firing. Uh, Rebecca has a moment where she starts saying, like, we're in the middle of a town. Watch out. And even his uh, his friends aren't immune from it because uh, the one thug carrying Happy is like, watch out, bro, and drops Happy. And the glass breaks, and Rebecca dives for Happy, and we get another flashback. Jesus. Uh, and it's a bunch oh. of people saying, hey, are you oh okay my. over there? And it's somebody saying, a drunk driver of that cargo transport plowed right through. Uh, and they're saying, oh, the girl was all right, but the cat that was with her, I knew it! <laughs> they killed the cat! <laughs> no, they killed it in the flashback. That still counts for me. <laughs> uh, she's saying, happy, no, why? You said we'd be together forever. And, uh, some random person says, stop it. I love this quick exchange. <laughs> stop it. It's a filthy, and some guy's like, shut up! It's a dying girl holding her kid, cat holding her girl holding her dying cat. Shut up! <laughs> and uh, she says, no, he's not. He's, he's my friend. Give him back, God. Please give Happy back. And uh, she, she holds in the present Happy, and she says, I'll never let go of you again. Holy shit! <laughs> and he's a robot. And he's robot guns. <laughs> He's a fucking transformer. <laughs> he turns. He's into, a gun transformer. He turns into two different guns, and uh, Rebecca says, "You have a lot of nerve kidnapping my happy, and you're gonna pay, Ducky." You're gonna pay, Ducky. <laughs> and I get one of the dudes is like, "Ducky," and she starts going crazy shooting these guys. I guess this is supposed to be like the Tonfa blasters that Ellie used in in Rave Master and that they don't shoot actual bullets, but like little tiny explosions. Because otherwise, she just outright has headshot like seven people. Uh, Every blast hits a guy in the head. Nobody's that good. And they say all a gun really needs is a good RPS. Rounds per second. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be some code for like, oh, they have like sensor track, like auto aim or something like that. Uh, And he's uh, going crazy with his big Gatling gun. Uh, Shiki. I remember because he was being super inaccurate before and almost hurting his friends. Yes. So Shiki lifts them both into the sky. He says, easier to aim, right? And... Uh, Rebecca gets an evil look on her face, doesn't she? She yeah. does. And I'm st- I, I got confused for a moment because I couldn't tell who if I was, that was Shiki or not uh, floating there. But yeah, it's her and she... She shoots him. She says, the Happy Blasters have a Ducky RPS, too, Morn. So, like, I guess this is, like, her frick. Like, she says Ducky instead of fucker or something like that. Or, or fuck. Well, I don't know. Okay. Ducky is a British term. So, let's see here. Adjective. Oh, Charming. Sus. Delightful. <laughs> so, she... So, so she's the one who's been giving all British off. She, 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 she's the one. Happy oh, Rebecca. <laughs> I'm a famous beat you, but you put your butt in more than on him, me out. Oh, I have the blasts as I do, and I shoots the ducky quicky quack quack or PSI has. Shucky ducky quack quack, yes. Yep. And she says, those are ether bullets, so they'll hurt a little, but they won't kill anyone. Blech. And she does a little, like, tongue winky face thing. Such an and uh, face. Shiki's like, oh, I don't think you need a bodyguard. <laughs> and uh, we have a little discussion about how Happy is a robot. And he's like, wow, you're way more lifelike than the robots on Grand Bell. And Happy exclaims, there's a lot of machines like me. Like that guy? There, it's an android. And uh, Rebecca explains that Happy got into an accident a while ago and that he has a mechanical body, but he'll always be happy. And then we go back to the flashback. What the fuck? This seems terrifying to me. How did that happen? <laughs> Uh, I guess this poor girl, this poor homeless abandoned girl had access to a lot of really cool equipment because she made a robot happy that seems to have How did the she same for his consciousness <laughs> seems to have the consciousness of happy. <laughs> and uh, she's happy because even though he's a robot now, she's he's still happy and she doesn't care what they looks like. He'll be happy forever and they'll be together forever. So, uh, Shiki has a bit of a moment of kind of, like, realization when he's just like, oh, right, you know, like, she, that's why she was really impassioned before about friends and machines. So, it's like a little yeah. touchback there. 
And they arrive at the Adventurer's Guild. Fairy tale, shooting starlight. Sorry. Got uh, flashbacks there. And uh, they're going to have their adventure starting today. And we cut into space with the Koopa Troopa spaceship, I think. <laughs> oh! <laughs> if Bowser's on this ship, I may lose it in excitement. Because this looks like a ship. <laughs> this looks like a ship Bowser would fly in. Someone's screaming, your highness, your highness. And uh, I guess her highness says, what? So much shouting. Are you asking me cut into? Is this fucking Urza? This is it's the Urza, Urza character, it's isn't the Urza it? Urza character. Uh, he's like, sorry, my lady, but there's an emergency. The demon king's son, or maybe his grandson. He's left Grand Bell. She says, are you certain? He's like, yeah. He was seen at Blue Garden. And the character says, ha ha. So the time is beginning to move. Yeah, it's just fucking Urza. It's... It's exactly Urza, but, but no, this one's the armored space pirate LC Chris. It's using the same shit too. At least Hero had the fucking balls to make Gerard use a different type of magic than Siegfried. She's just okay. So instead of instead of Urza, she's Urz. Instead of Scarlet, she's Crimson. <laughs> So XP. Oh, hold on, wait. Wasn't Ezra's last Urza's last name something like Crimson as well? Or, uh, Scarlet. Urza Scarlet. Urza Scarlet. Yeah. So it is the same fucking name, basically. Fuck. B Cuber was more creative than this Best. shit. We're never going to escape from bullshit Urza moments. Her fucking series ended. We're still gonna get them. Maybe. Here's what I'm hoping. No, it won't. It's only been like six months since the series ended. He hasn't changed his ways, Chris. Here's what I'm hoping. <laughs> She's a villain in this one, and she won't become a good guy. She'll be a cool villain, Chris. I guarantee she's going to become a hero before the end, like this like first arc. But the calendar year won't be done before she's a hero. Fuck. <laughs> because uh, she... And you know why, Chris? Because she's Elsie. <laughs> I hope that's the first chapter. <laughs> Everyone says it immediately. They're like, oh no. Well, you guys read Fairy Tale, right? You know what this chick's all about. They're like, wait, so in universe I'm supposed to recognize that she's Ursa too? They're like, yeah, I mean, you have to accept that the fact that Rebecca was able to carry a cat's consciousness into its new robot body. <laughs> Nick, what'd you feel about this chapter? You know what? I'm actually really happy to we have this back. Because <laughs> you know what? There was never a dull moment when it came to fairy tale. So even if the hero is just going to be like, eh, I'm just going to, you know, just like move like a quarter of the cast into this new series and rehash big chunks of it. You know what? Fuck it. Because it was always there was always something to talk about. So let's fucking do it. I'm game for it. All right. Um, and hey. Happy this time turns into fucking guns. So that's an improvement. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I can't wait for Hero's next series, Elsa Burgundy. <laughs> that's a good one, Shatter. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> All right, let's. <laughs> Let's talk about Alice and Tayo, our new, newest jump start from Shonen Jump. Um, <laughs> all right, after all that, and I think that Seven Deadly Sins is going to take us a little while too. I'm going to try and not get bogged down in the jump starts and stuff. Alice and Tayo looks to be a music series uh, in which our two main characters, Alice and Tayo, meet each other um, because Alice over here is Tayo playing the keyboard. And uh, she recognizes his name when he introduces or rather not when he introduces himself to her, but when he panics and runs away because he hates, you know, he, he does not. He has stage fright. That's essentially the whole plot of this chapter. He has tremendous stage fright. So despite his talents as a musician, he never wants to perform live. Uh, but Alice kind of falls, tracks him down and uh, finds him on the uh, train on the way home. And uh, she's like, hey, you want to come with me like on a date? He's like, ah! so they go to her house, which is a, not her house, but a music studio that uh, her her cousin owns that she's crashing at. She goes to school and uh, she kind of 
prods him uh, into playing a song on the keyboard that they have there, and then she sings along with it. And she and he's like, "Why does she know the lyrics?" And but he doesn't stop playing because he's captivated by her voice, and they keep on playing and singing together. And she's like, I knew it. I knew who you were because I've heard this song before. It was put up on SoundCloud. I found your I found your album uh, and uh, I recognized your name S. Tayo, because this is obviously the most unoriginal guy ever. He's like, I'll just use the initial in my name. So um, she's like, I recognize your song, Tayo. And she tries to get him. He's like, you should join the music club with me. And well. We're performing together. And he's like, no, I have to leave. And she's like, I love your music, Tayo. Come on, I'm going to have a performance tomorrow. I'm going to sing. You better come. Um, then eventually the performance happens after Tayo is like, no, I don't want to go. And the lightning strikes and the power goes out. And so because the lights are out uh, and she starts singing the song, so Tayo goes up and gets on the piano and accompanies her. But the lights are out so nobody can see him. So he doesn't get stage fright. And everyone's like, wow, it's amazing. And uh, everyone's super blown away by it, including the two of them. And uh, afterwards, you know, he disappears and Alice rushes off and gives him a hug and is like, hey, you were great. That was great. Thank you. Uh, and hey, you hear that? They're they're applauding. They're actually yelling for an encore. The two of us, we should take over the world with music. And so I was like, um. And that's how the chapter ends. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this one was fine. There's, like, it's not. I think it's gonna have the problem that every sort of series like this has, where it's like you just can't really capture music without an audio component. And I guess the really the thing that only kind of held, held me cap captured in this one was the art style. I kind of dug, and the personalities were were big enough that I was able to get into it. But uh, I don't know. It feels like it's gonna need something to hang around. This was a, apparently a one-shot last year in Jump, um, and then it's been uh, adapted into a you know actual ongoing series. And you can kind of see that in it. It seems like you know it follows the beats of a full story, but then it's like, and now we're going to take on the world with music. It's like, okay, well now you got to do the whole series based off of that concept. So it kind of makes me wonder where you're going to go from here. And yeah, I agree. You know, every time that you have like a, an actual performing music series, there is that challenge there. Uh, it seems like this is going to be a, you know, a kind of more um, endearing but less weird uh, Xiaomi experience, Shiori experience rather. Mm. Uh, so, but and we'll see how it goes in the next couple of chapters that we get uh, for the jump start. Uh, Seiji Tanaka. Well, that chapter was a chapter. Um, he did his assignment, and another assassin shows up, so Seiji fights off the assassin again. And uh, he does his homework assignment. What a chapter, guys! Uh, I, I'm sorry. Girls of not, not, not into it. Um, I know I've seen some people that are you know really into this because it's you know a very different kind of idea, a different Is sort it? of aesthetic for a series. It's Jeff. It's Jeff. Um, <laughs> I love like once per week we just fucking dunk on Jeff. I didn't dunk on him. I was like, I know some people some people are into this because I've seen you. Where's like, Jeff? He's, like, oh, He's into cool. garbage gotcha games and <laughs> stupid manga. <laughs> stupid manga, some of which we also like. <laughs> um, and I can see people having you know a taste for this, but it's, you know it's like it's okay. It's an action series, whatever you know, and. It's it's very much like this chapter is really just an echo of the first one, so I felt like I didn't really get anything else out of it. So that's fair. Okay, Doctor Stone. It's time to get stoned. Z equals sixty four hotline. So uh, da, 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 uh, scrolling back to the page that one. Okay. Right, they managed to uh, subdue Hamura so that the away team can actually deliver the cell phone to Sukasa's uh, territory. Uh, I don't know how Crow manages to do this, but he somehow winds up in the clutch of a statue that's like just sit standing there. He just like somehow backs into and up into it. I don't know how he managed that. Like it's impressive that he managed to have the exact placement to do that without meaning to. 
basically there's a whole bunch of statues gathered there, uh, very mean looking guys, uh, all strong looking. And uh, Chrome and Gen and Magma, mostly Gen, figure out, I was like, ah, so look, you can see they've got you know n- numbers uh, painted on their foreheads. Uh, starting from 33 and then going upwards. So this is the actual, the priority that they have to depetrify people. And if the first one starts at 33, then that means that we have to conclude that Tsukasa has revived 32 others by this point. Um, so Magma comes up with a very pragmatic uh, idea in this case, which is, hey, why don't we smash up these guys right now? And he's like, oh, okay, that would be too much work. What if we snapped off their arms and legs so that they couldn't help in a fight? That is, like, an oddly genius idea for Magma. Um, and McGinn and Cromer be like, um... Gen <laughs> uh, does start to say, like, I mean, destroying them would be our best option pragmatically. And Magma's like, yes, I was right! <laughs> uh, but Gen has this brief little visual as he, you know, watches them getting ready to smash one of these things. He just, you know, looks in the, at the face of one of these guys and he imagines him as, you know, just a kid, you know, eating at home while his parents are, you know, looking after him. And he grabs Magma and he's like, hey, hey, you know, as far as we know, these guys haven't done anything wrong. You know, if we knew that they were evil, maybe. But you know what? I, I, I like to pretend that I'm a pragmatist, but I fear that when push comes to shove, I'm actually weak. It's a nice moment for him. Yeah. Uh, and he says Tsukasa is capable of such things, however, such is his strength. And that makes him an earsome faithful who must be stopped. Um, and Crow was like, yeah, and Mag was going to smash them up right away. And Mag was like, I don't know these people. I don't know them anything. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that. Like, Mag was such a great character. This chapter is like, oh, these fuckers, shit. <laughs> I don't know these dudes. So, again, why can't I smash them? <laughs> <laughs> um... And uh, you know, Chrome tries to say it again. It's like, hey, you know, it's the fact that you can, that they aren't choosing to do this, that doesn't make you weak. You know, we're trying to actually be the good guys here without spilling blood. And all we got to do is recruit faster than Tsukasa can replace. Let's do this. Get the cell phone hotline up and running on the double. So they a little bit of time passes and they come across a cross, a to- tomb marker, grave marker. There we go. And uh, they're like, what the hell is this? And Gen says, it's, it's a grave. And Magma says, what, did one of his soldiers die? No, it's uh, it's Senku's grave. And <laughs> Magma's like, Senku's dead! <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, apparently Taiju and... Uh, I don't know why that joke completely missed over my head the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Senku's dead! <laughs> this guy is so stupid. <laughs> he's just like, oh my god, he's dead and his grave got here before us! <laughs> Um, and uh, they, Taiju and Yuzuriha erected this under Senku's instructions because like, hey, you know, I'm supposed to be dead so make sure that you pay a visit to my grave, right? Um, basically, this was kind of established as a meeting location from the very beginning when they first uh, split off, which is like, oh, it's a nice, nice idea. You know, Senku's the type of schemer that would think of that kind of detail. There's a whole vast wilderness separating them, so you gotta have a place to come back to. Um, and so this is going to be used as a drop point for the cell phone, which uh, Senku says, yes, the perfect holy ground. Tsukasa's army don't care about a, about me or my grave, and it it will be. <laughs> and Ken says, dearly departed Senku's grave is going to start talking like a hotline to the spirit world. <laughs> so they start to uh, bury the um, the cell phone, including you know, the wire and everything like that. And. Um, there's a weird bit where Magma's, like, got a bunch of, like, kindling that's just surrounding the grave marker, and I don't know, I guess that he's thinking, like, oh, if we leave it out in the open, we have to surround it with kindling so that they won't see it, but because there's just, like, a freaking ring of sticks surrounding the gravestone now, they're like, no, no, everyone, everyone's gonna wonder what the fuck happened here. Um, so they start digging and trying to get it uh, mostly buried so that only someone actually physically right in front of it would be able to see it. 
uh, and they're like, God damn it, there's this big rock in the way, and Magma's like, I got it! <laughs> Smashes it, makes a whole bunch of noise. With an axe, too. Like, yeah, <laughs> impressive. Like, that, I mean, come on now. I, I remember how far, uh, 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 farm, farm Crossing, that's not the name, Animal Crossing. Farm <laughs> You need, you couldn't break a big rock with the with an axe. It, it wouldn't work. You needed to have a hammer to do that. So mm-hmm. he he's just gonna break that hammer and, and or that axe and chip it. It's worth. Of course, somebody's alerted to this. Of course, somebody's alerted to this. So they just like a oh, fucking bury it completely and let's get go hide. Um and uh, again, to, uh, hopefully one of the may or rather um. Let's see here. Oh, Mag was like, you guys really scare easily again, says, no, nah, no, nah, one of them has a really good pair of ears on him. So, uh, and sure enough, um, this very, very, I've been waiting to play Robin Hood all my life guy shows up with bow and arrow and the stupidest hat. That is a dumb cap. I hate this guy already. <laughs> Uh, and he actually nearly fucking shoots Gen in the head, uh, only just barely misses him. And are we talking and, about great hats? His cap is way dumber than that hat, Chris. <laughs> um, and so they go scampering off. Um, so uh, shortly enough, coming to visit the grave. Oh, pair of familiar figures. And uh, Yuzuriha seems to notice something just uh, inside on the ground. So Taiju fucking just bah! reaches under the dirt and just, I guess, lifts the whole thing up whole. <laughs> oh, no, he just grabs the speakerphone. OK. <laughs> um, and all. Yeah, it's after something like half a year. So Taiju and Yuzuriha have shown up again and Senku starts speaking with them, which with, you think that a hoy hoy is a weird way of greeting someone over the phone. Senku says, Hey, bud. Makes sense. So weird for him to say that. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, bud. How you doing? What are you up to? Yeah. What are you so. wearing? It's like sheepskin rags, like you. Hot. Anyway, you ready to start a revolution? So Yuzuri and Taiju are overjoyed to hear from their friend again. You know, got tears in their eyes and stuff. And uh, everyone at the uh, Village of Science is celebrating that they managed to actually communicate with them over such long distance. And I do like the detail, the, just the little joke that was thrown in at the end, where Taiju's like, oh, Senku! And the guy who's spying on them is like, oh, wow, they're being really loud this, this, this visit over their dead friend. <laughs> um... Yeah, that's the chapter. So they got the hotline set up, and uh, hey, Taiju and Yuzuri are back. Indeed. Good times. I'm excited to see nice them again. Ch- nice chapter. Uh, All right. Like the, like the little details in it. Now, Chris, how long can you get into We Never Learn with that hat? I'm going to go for it. Crazy on your headphones. It is an awkward fit. We're going to see how long we can do this. Okay. So, We Never Learn. The sexiest chapter, chapter 69. Okay. A post-festival celebration of X, both dazzling and lonely. So we open with, you know, fuck, we don't have time for a full long recap. I was right when I mentioned last week that they were just using it as a way to, like, celebrate, to, like, piggyback on top of the You were correct, festival. yes. So yes. the U- Udon Festival is being used for that point. And they also showcase that uh, Takamoto has not changed out of her pretty care outfit or whatever whatever no. the name of it was. Because she likes it, because you, you got made it for her, and she put so much work into it. She wanted to be like, I wanted to show my appreciation. Mm. Yeah. And uh, we also get a, a little showcase to see that Ashwi is really, really good at pulling people in because she's helping to sell the Udon probably more than anybody. And, uh, you know, uh, is just like, well, I, I just piggybacked onto the, the whole lecture and everything like that. He sees you. Uh, oh, Yusuria. Uh, not Yusuria. Um, <laughs> Headphones appear over her head. <laughs> He sees Fumino and he's like, man, she's so, like, unfrazzled by that kiss. She's so good. And she's, like, quietly in her mind, like, was it my first kiss? Definitely wasn't my first kiss. Oh, God, that was my first kiss, wasn't it? Uh, and then Kirisu comes by, who's like, time to clean up. Nobody's doing it. She's like, fine, I'll let you guys have this fun for once. Aww. 
We're going to cut through a lot of this here because a lot of this is kind of set up for the fact that they're about to have the fireworks celebration come through. I will say I do like the moment of Ogata being like, hey, I'm not really good with people, but you guys all really helped me out here. And I really appreciate everyone you know, helping me do this, especially you, <laughs> Uh And then the moment they're all waiting for happens and we see all the characters who want to actively have someone touching you, Wega, when this happens, some of them being themselves, have, like, their eyes light up, like robots <laughs> activating. And we see every one of, like, the main three girls has their own support squad run up and shove that particular girl into Uega. And it happens in a way where Uega was sandwiched between him and the other two girls that are in this harem. So the three girls get pushed into Uega, and then he falls into the other two girls, and they're a big pile of harem. Oh, no! <laughs> that really far. <laughs> but the firework... The perfect here... on-text quote for people who can't see that hat. Just so you go, a big pile of harem. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> but then it turns out the firework didn't go off. There was a misfire. Oh, a double subversion. So, Could there be a triple subversion? So everyone's like, why did you shove me in? You know, I'm mad at you. And every, like everybody's getting angry. Like the girls who got pushed are getting angry at the people who pushed them. And Uega's like, what was that? That's now. And he was, he's thinking about the legend. He's like, why am I taking this so seriously? And he grabs on to someone's hand, says thank you. And the fireworks go off as this mysterious girl is cloaked in the shadow of the light. And... We don't really know what happens here. They nope. they say, you know, they reiterate the thing that they say when the first firework goes up. Any couple that's touching the moment it launches will be forever intertwined. And he's thinking, like, intertwined? Me? And he's looking towards the group of five girls. Which, honestly, if this was the final chapter of the series, this feels like a really fitting end to it. <laughs> but What? All five of them being happy, independent of Yuga while he's just sitting there confused? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it's... I, I'm wondering if this is supposed to be like oh which one of the girls was it and he doesn't know or the like this is a mystery sixth person it well that's the thing about it is because the features that you can see of the person who helps you go up are completely obscured i mean you can tell that it's you know a, an effeminate hand in the brief glimpses you get of it but then again you has got a little bit effeminate hands but then all five of them are just immediately in position watching the fireworks or you know uh, if you're assuming just studying <laughs> yeah that's what i mean like everybody's doing something that should be just it doesn't she's not even studying because she's got a book open but her eyes are closed so she's just napping she's like i'm not going to have fun <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh i do i do actually appreciate the you know roundabout way of going about this you know you it goes for the twist that you're expecting is like oh all five of them touched him at once but then the fireworks don't go off. So I was like, oh, oh, OK. But then the fireworks do go off and he is touching one person. And yeah, like you said, it could be one of the five girls or it could be a six character that we know nothing about. Probably not. But it leaves that door open and just makes things extra confusing for you. I'm and I do like the way that it ends on that note. And I do really like the visual, the big two page spread of him being helped up while the giant fireworks go off in the background. I'm hoping that this is the latter and that this is a new character and that this new character is kind of in into a group that's already kind of established what their feelings towards one another is is that they're like oh but fate is what has us together and that's like the kind of in because if it doesn't this feels way too much like uh nisekoi where it's like oh Who which was girl was Who it did he make the promise with and he yeah. can't remember and everything like that I mean, who knows? Next chapter, he could just be like, man, Takamoto, it was weird when we, you helped me up last week. I'm like, felt weird to make it ambiguous, but whatever. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I we shall see, I guess, with what happens here. Well, and also, if it's just intertwined, then maybe it doesn't even necessarily mean to be romantic. It could be. And, you know, somebody suggests, like, oh, maybe it's Kirisu, and that's because he's eventually going to get a teaching job in the same school with her or something like that. Mm -hmm. I gotta understand it. There's a lot of directions they can go, and it feels unfair to judge the series based on 
what it might be. So I'll just say, based on this, I really like this arc, as I think you mentioned last week or the week before. It's been really nice just having, like, a stretch of chapters in Isekoi that have told one coherent, continuous story and haven't been entirely focused on whether or not Kirisu is going to get home from being naked at the beach or not. So... It's, it's been nice to have that. Yeah, it was a nice little arc, and I thought that it was basically the perfect length to have like this. Each of the characters got to do a little something. Uh, each, each of them had to, uh, you know, either help to solve a problem or had a little problem of their own that you could help them out with. And uh, at the end, we have this little bit of a tease that I think is different for this series. We haven't really had this kind of moment for We Never Learn yet. The moment of like... Huh, oh, maybe I should actually think about romance, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, the pizza bet goes on. It goes on. It's going to yeah. never end. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> we, ne- we never resolve the pizza bet. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, here's what we do, Nick. We start our own harem manga based off the pizza bet, like the forbidden love romance of the pizza bet. <laughs> And it continues to extrapolate. Legend, more. legend says that when the that when the fireworks go off, whichever ingredient most recently touched your tongue, your fates will be intertwined. No, it's like it's boys and girls, and then like more people get involved in our pizza bet, and that becomes our harem of people. Like, who's gonna have the pizza bet hailed on the morning? Finally, oh, super satisfying. I'm gonna start I'm gonna start penning something up for it now. All right. Next up is the is uh, the promise Neverland. It's the big finish. So uh, we uh, opened oddly enough not on Emma getting her guts gouged out, but from Ray's perspective, where you know he's just thinking that you know is my life was cursed. Uh, I, time I I bet you're wondering how I got her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> it's like him doing a cool jumping pose as Emma gets gunned in the background. He's like, I am there. I know what you're thinking. I am pretty cool. Please frame on the, on the fingers going through her stomach. <laughs> yeah. That's, hashtag right. No, wait, wait, wait. No, no, not, not her. Hang on. It pans over to him and he's got sunglasses on, a fidget spinner, and his arms are crossed. <laughs> well, I'm also doing a backflip. <laughs> I bet you're wondering how this cool dude got here. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, that, that 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 girl getting killed right there, that's about She's like my best friend, maybe. <laughs> She's like 90% cooler because of, you know, <laughs> because of being in my presence. <laughs> I know how it all started. <laughs> I'll tell you. It's when I was uh, a baby. Because <laughs> I remember my baby remarks. <laughs> As long as I can remember, Emma was next to me, crying like a little bitch. <laughs> I remember Emma, back before she had huge, enormous fingers through her spine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I knew, I knew Emma before it was cool to have her fingers gouged through her stomach. <laughs> I was just deciding at that point whether or not a side bangs was worth it or not. Oh I had God. yet invented fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I can't love the right Oh character. my God, she rises and say, you give us an inch and we take it a mile <laughs> He's like, I'm just not going to put Ray. I'm killing Ray. I'm killing Ray so you don't do this stupid character anymore. Now I'm ghost, hashtag Ray. <laughs> oh, dear. Real Ray is very upset that his best friend, best living friend, has been stabbed through the stomach. I was like, oh, I'm Emma. And Louvis, um, very weirdly for this moment, like gently places her body down. I was like, thank you. That was enjoyable. Thank you to, to and to your friends. I give my utmost respect. All right, bullets. <laughs> <laughs> We're shooting him, and he's like catching bullets. All right, still fighting. So everyone's like, "Get up, get up, Emma." <laughs> so Emma has a uh, near-death experience. Uh, she like feels her body feels blood leaving her body and feels numbness overtaking her and has this just vision of uh lucas and the 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 uh unnamed geezer um just crying over their friends bodies um everyone that was part of the resistance group being upset uh over their lost friends people being snatched away killed by luvis and just like I have to get up. I need to defeat Luvis. And she imagines all of her family surrounding her. I need to return to my family. 
And Phil's there, too. <laughs> and he's just like, am I? <laughs> That's right, I had a line. <laughs> so, then, bizarrely enough, she imagines Chrome being like, wow, you suck. <laughs> Um, she then imagines, like, her spirit falling out of her body and then trying to, like, go back into it to force herself to move because like, I don't want to die. I can't die yet. And finally, she imagines Norman appearing before her, taking her spirit's hand and leading her back up to the surface where another hand reaches down, flying to Isabella. And she's like, you can't give up here. You still have to fulfill the future I want. And fucking, like, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> and we're just like... <laughs> I am a real American. Do, 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 do. For the rights of orphan kids. <laughs> I'm and, not a huge fan of black people. <laughs> but for, like, oh, right, I forgot there was this extra verse in the Hulk Hogan theme song. <laughs> It just randomly changed in 2000... When did you make those remarks? 60? Whatever. So, um, she's holding the special gun in her hand. She's like, all right, the pistol I chose was right at the shelter. You're right, Norman, if I use it. But I can't speak. I can barely stand. What do I do? How do I let them know? And Ray's like, shoot that fucker! And it was like, yes, perfect. Thank you, mind reading Ray. Yeah, sorry, that I, I, I totally did that on purpose. And everyone shoots Lupus, and he's like, <laughs> bullet time. I can stop all of them. This concludes the battle. I'm sorry it's ending. Wait a minute. What's that bullet? Emma shot it. What's that? Oh, no. That bullet's not a bullet. It's a... Uh, and a flash bomb goes off. I do like that the effect of just the entire page after uh, the flash bomb going off is just white. Because, oh yeah, he's blind again. Or he's going to be blind again. And he realizes, oh, I've reacted too late. I can't prevent it from detonating. If I close my eyes, I can't stop all the bullets. If I don't close my eyes, I'll be blinded and still be shot by bullets. And I can't regenerate if I get hit by all these bullets. Oh no. And then he gets rid of with bullets... And he's, he's like, I've lost. I knew it. Humans are the best. And then the old man shoots him right in the fucking eye and kills him. It's pretty satisfying, honestly. I was very dissatisfied with the last couple of chapters where I was just like, I know we have guns. <laughs> but the, these last few pages were really cool. I will note. I liked it. I do wish the end had been a little less, like, deus ex, oh, right, I have this. When Emma's finally like, oh, right, I have a gun with a flashbang in it, and fires it. Like, didn't we establish that was really effective against it? Why wouldn't you have used it again when it seemed like you needed it, instead of waiting till you got gored? Well, you see, Chris, when you have a few moments to catch your breath, and you plan out your next mode of attack... You won't think of such details, but when you come back from the grave and the ghost of your not dead friend tells you what to do, <laughs> it, I don't, I wouldn't have a problem with it if this weren't normally such a like cerebral series, you know? So it, it's, it's just a strange thing that they introduced a gun that wasn't about the speed or caliber or bullets it shot, but rather using creative thinking to kind of take it to like use it and that gun was ultimately the thing they needed to win but there is it like more of a moment of like oh right like because they established emma's had this gun since she got here they didn't take it away from her when they brought her here or anything like that so yeah. she's always had this gun it's always been in her back pocket and presumably she knows what's in it. Like, i think she talked about how she knows like what's in there yeah she just discussed what its different functions were because there's like a net launcher and stuff yeah so it's weird that she brings it up now and there's not more to it than just like now i use it to take it out 
I agree with you. Like, I like the ending to this. It's really badass, too, that the old geezer gets the final shot in him as kind of, like, revenge for all of his friends who were killed. So I really appreciate that. But it is strange to me that, like, the finale to all this was Emma, like, Oh, right! I have this! If only, like, if this had been, like, her plan from the beginning, or, like, and now at the moment when it's right, I'll use this. And, or, like, she was always planning to use it, but then she got speared through the stomach, and so she didn't have the opportunity before that point. But, yeah. It's a shame, too, because the the battle against Mom was so intense, and at the end of it, it was like, oh, wait, Emma outsmarted her from the very beginning. And that could have been the moment here as well where, you know, uh, Louvis is just like, oh, wow, these kids really are that smart. Like, they outsmarted me from the beginning, but instead he was just, it, it feels more like he was just like, oh, they had that? Shit. Like, there's not more of a moment to it than that. All right. So. All right. Chris. Let's jump into our second live reading. Although, that's live reading with an asterisk. I did flip through this thing really quick, so I have some idea of what I'm talking about okay. this time. So, From what I understand, there's some complicated stuff happening in this Yes, chapter, I, so. I got what they're going for, though. So, Seven Deadly Sins, Chapter 273, The Victims of the Holy War. So, last chapter... We had this whole big thing with the Demon King and Melodius in Purgatory talking about Esterosa and their memories of Esterosa and realizing something was up. And at the end, it indicated that Gauther had some connection to that. So we start with Gauther flying off on Pe uh, a Hawk, which I don't remember when can he turn into like a weird like manta ray thing that flies through the air. Is that someone else's power that they're using on him? Or has Hawk has always had that ability? Hawk has ever... the ability to take on the traits of things that he eats. So he carries around little bits of meat from different creatures so that he can transform like that. Gotcha, gotcha. So they're talking about, like, oh, hey, you know, what's up with that guy? And Esterosa says, like, Esterosa? No, that man is. And then we get the flashback <laughs> to... I'm going to have to call him Real Gauther and Puppet Gauther because they're both Gauther. Right. So Real Gauther is talking to Puppet Gauther to explain that in order to end the Holy War, I'm now going to invoke a forbidden spell in exchange for everything about me. I'm doing something that's unheard of, but I'm going to die for it. And it's going to alter one man's memories and the perception of everyone that knows him, even the gods. And they're saying, yes, that's because this spell is so powerful and this man is so powerful that if the spell succeeds, the goddesses will not have to use the coffin of eternal darkness. But I still need a little magic to do so, so I'm going to need some of yours as well, Puppet Gauther. And he says, sure. And then Real Gauther says, I hope you forgive me for burdening you with this grave sin, my child. And we cut back. And we actually cut back to King and De Ray Ray. I had to remember her name for a moment. Who are flying in along with the other two archangels. I'm not going to remember their names because they're not fucking important. Uh, and they're flying in and they see the remains of the aerial theater. Where this whole big exchange between Elizabeth and uh, Esther Rosa is happening. And they're like, oh, there he is. I can see him. And what we see is not Esther Rosa anymore. <laughs> it's like Esther Rosa like attached to this giant like hulking tendrily liquidy goopy monster thing i don't know what to really call it but it's just saying like elizabeth is mine now and gather explains basically like okay so you know you must know if their perception of him could return to normal once altered you know it's a good question there's a slight chance but still there and all the perception of those affected will be jointly shared so if one of them were to undergo some unforeseen accident and produce a ripple in it, then the others would surely but surely crack altogether. So it seems as though because I don't know if it's supposed to be Esther Rosa had it first or if it maybe was Elizabeth. I'm not sure. Somebody basically started to realize something's up and now everybody's starting to realize something's up and we go into this big battle and. Esteros is too strong. He's whooping everybody's ass. They're just like, but everybody's kind of having this problem too, where they're just like, why can't I remember this guy's face? Why can't, why can't I remember Male's face? Like, why, what's going on with my memory and everything like that? And they're like, is, is Esterosa the one behind it? And, uh, you know, Esterosa is screaming and everything like that. And we cut away to Elizabeth thinking about him again. And she says, Melodius would never tell a lie to hurt his little brother. He was always thinking about you about Zeldris. And everyone's like, huh? So he says, I want to do something to help Zeldris and his girl. 
And she says, I'm sure you really do. You really care for your brother. And uh, we see Melodius. So he's like, well, Zeldris is my one and only brother. What? And Melodius thinks, why would I say that? Then, then what about Estarosa? And we cut away to a scene where uh, <laughs> Elizabeth picks up a dog. And she's like, who's this dog? And, uh, or, sorry. Melodius finds a dog. Elizabeth finds a dog. I'm sorry. I got mixed up on this. As, uh, there's too many fucking weird names in this goddamn chapter. Melodia says, whose dog is this? Elizabeth says, I found him. He was hurt and unable to walk. And she's, you know, he asks, does he have a name? And he, she says, Estarosa. Melodia named him. I don't know who the fuck found this dog. You know what? Fuck it. I forget it. <laughs> Somebody found this stupid fucking dog and they called it Estarosa. Estarosa is not a real person. That's the name they gave the dog. <laughs> Because we're going to get the real reveal well, no, here. No, 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 because she's talking to Mel, she, who she thinks is Meliodas, and then she goes, Meliodas named him. Yeah, so, okay, it's, it's very confusing where it's happening. And he says, what's the matter? That's a strange face to make. Do you not like it? He's like, oh, no, it's not that. And she's like, then who are you? It can't be. And we see an image of an archangel with long hair. And he says, I think it's a lovely name. And everyone starts realizing it at once, as, as Gauther kind of brought up. Whereas, like, their, their, their shared perception has finally cracked. The memories of all who know him are returning to their rightful form. Memories of him being a demon are now changing to him being a goddess. And memories of his big brother being Melodius are changing to his big brother being Ludashell. And, uh, you know, Gauther has this whole thing. He's like, there's one other sin that I committed together with Gauther, and it's my responsibility there was never an Estarosa of the Ten Commandments. This is the true form of the man everyone only perceived to be as such. The male of the four archangels. And we see what we've known to be Estarosa having enormous angelic wings erupt from his back. You told me that you killed my brother. Well, <laughs> the spirit of male was destroyed and corrupted by Estarosa. So, from a certain point of view... <laughs> this is some real Kingdom Hearts level shit, too. <laughs> it really is. Like, memories and corruption, and, uh, yeah. It's, um... I think that you would kind of need to, like, read over the last few chapters in a row to kind of get the full impact of this moment. Because in this... If you just read this in isolation, it is kind of hard to keep up with. Uh, because... Yeah, people's names are changing in the middle of, like, sentences. Huh. So, um, but I'm sure that it all makes sense if it, it all flows together, if you actually read it all in one continuous read. So, it is very curious. There's a lot of questions to come from this. But the one thing is that this makes sense. It doesn't feel like an ass pull. It feels like there's actually quite a lot in place ahead of time to really establish this, especially for, like the amount of time that we've spent really with like Estorosa and everyone being like this something's wrong something's up with Estorosa and people being like why can't and, I agree? and also just the archangels in general having them get heavily involved recently and, and weird questions that you kind of had too like why would Melodius say like oh I'm going to try to help you get in, like I'm going to try to help you get with my the girlfriend the girl I already like like these things that just didn't seem to make much sense now have a new context to kind of explain it um one big question I have, though, is what does this mean for Escanar? Because they sort of established that Escanar was the reincarnation of male and had his power. So what does that put him in all of this? It's, it's kind of mm -hmm. an interesting thing yeah. to get an answer for. But I do definitely like this twist a lot. Uh, I also like the notion of, like, this secret that the real Gauther has always done. He's just hidden one of the, the archangels from the world. It's, it's an interesting way to kind of do things. Yeah. And it gives a shit ton of life to Asterosu, who already felt like he had, like, a full mm -hmm. thing. But Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's move on to Black Clover. Page 163. Smiles. Tears. So, um, Asta tries to stab with his magic Curie sword, the uh, elf guy possessing Luck. And Luck has a near-death experience. Now, I'm not going to say, you know, blame any particular series for this, but there's a lot of different chapters in Jump that just had, like, similar weird things going on. There, You know, three different, like, near-death experiences, 
two different ones where they see everyone that they someone that they care about and pushes them to to you know rejoin the land of the living uh heroic standing up despite being heavily wounded between emma and endeavor it's just a weird uh, coincidence that all that a bunch of that happened this week yeah uh so luck um is just envisions himself standing in a void of darkness uh and he can vaguely hear uh, like stuff in the real world. Um, and uh, I was like, what's going on there? I, think, I feel like I could hear voices very faintly. I was like, hmm. And he looks over and he can see his mother. And his mother says, you aren't normal, Luck. You should come here. You must come stay with me. And Luck's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mom's the only one who loves me. I live for her sake in order to make her smile. Meanwhile, the elf possessing luck is like, I'm going to kill everything. Aren't we elves such complex and deep characters? Uh, and, you know, it's like, you killed everyone. I, I'll kill everything. I'll kill everyone that I'll destroy everything precious to you and all that stuff. Uh, then uh, Asta says, like, I don't really know what you're talking about, but... If, what, if it was our fault, the human's fault, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. But Locke is a precious friend, so I'm begging you, don't take him. Besides, would the people who are precious to you want you to turn into something like this? Because he's all demonic looking and crackling with evil. Uh, Locke's self responds by saying, Aah! Uh So... Luck seems to hear this from his internal void of darkness and says, I'm sorry, but I have to go. I may not be much, but even I have something that's important to me now. So thanks for everything you've done for me. And he runs away and the vision of his mom is crying tears of happiness. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and then he, we get a series of different flashbacks of the first time that Luck met every member of the Black Bulls. Uh, I do like that Finral is there, but Yami just talks over him and covers him up with his speech bubble. Poor Finral. Uh, uh, let me see here. There is like, uh, yeah, there, it's very, pretty straightforward, like stuff you would expect from most of the characters. Although there is the, the little moment with Vanessa, just like, just think of me as your big sister. Okay. Uh, and also, I do like the detail that Charmy's like, here, have a bite of this. She's all about food. He's like, but she'll share her food. Um, and then we get a flashback from the elf's perspective uh, of, I believe it's the hum a human. I can't remember who this is, but saying, you know, I'm convinced that a world where your people and mine can live together as friends is on its way and we can learn to understand each other. And the elf suddenly goes, you know, me too. I wanted to make friends with humans too. Humans like you. And the curse breaks. Luck wakes up and he's very, very happy to see everyone. He's crying, tears of joy. He's like, I'm one of the black bulls, right? And man was like, of course you are, you idiot. And you bro hugs him. And that's the chapter. What do you think of this chapter, Nick? I have no strong feelings in either way, honestly. I, I enjoy most of it. I guess it just didn't dawn on me until this point, though. Like, the weird, sudden kind of... Maybe not sudden, but the, the weird kind of tonal whiplash of, like, I'm going to kill you all. I'm going to make you murder and die and everything. And he's like, but actually, I really just wanted friends like you. Like, and I can kind of sort of get that. But it does feel weird that, like, an entire page is all that that like development takes it feels like i think that it's because so many like every elf possession that we've seen so far is just very simple it's like you killed everyone i'm gonna kill all of you and then pff, broken yeah. yeah they're not they're not very fleshed out characters probably because they're just not sticking around very long uh what else does it I help mean, that the as you said, like the characters themselves get no develop like they they use abilities from somebody else we already know. They had they had no new magic themselves per se. No unique identity. Yeah. And like what would you say is the difference between this elf and the elf who took the poison mist guy? You're like, 
I, I don't really know. I guess that guy didn't get the other one thought that human. The other one thought the humans were particularly actually gross and disgusting, whereas the other one just wanted revenge, I guess. That's... I don't know. Well, luck's back. That lasted a while. All right. Let's move on to One Piece, Chapter 909, Seppuku. So this was a bit of a surprise. Uh, we got those several chapters like talking about, like, oh, the reverie is happening and the meeting between nations, and oh my god, is Vivi being targeted for something? What's going on? Oh, look at all these characters gathering around this one spot. The rebellion. Look what happened to Kuma. Bonnie is here. Oh, and Shirahoshi is showing up with a bunch of Nami clones. Look at all of these people that we've never seen before coming together for a big grand meeting. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> So we find out uh, where the minks have gone to begin with. Uh, most of them were, t- especially the injured ones, uh, met up with Marco the Phoenix, who gets a little bit of a character refresher for those of you who don't fucking remember his one appearance in the series so far. <laughs> I do like that they have like a full experience. Like, here's what he was. He was a member <laughs> of the White Beard Pirates. He was their right hand man after the Black Be- or White Beard lost. He went into revenge. They are the, they lost and are now scattered and remained. <laughs> like I, I wish it had almost just added. He has a mythical devil fruit, the only one we've really seen to this point, unless you count the video games. <laughs> Uh, and so we see him actually using his Phoenix powers on Cat Viper, uh, treating him. Uh, and we get uh, well, it's not, know, a big... uh, it's not Cat Viper. It's some it? weird. Oh, it's, it's some cat, wild animal. Cat, yeah. cat Viper just has to be happens. He's, to over, the next he's, he's just watching him. Right. Yeah. OK, so I do. Uh, love, I can't remember who it was, but somebody put the tweet in there with the great John Mulaney joke where he's just like, and he's wearing reading glasses now to show that time has passed. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a great joke <laughs> that's like how he ends the show too <laughs> and he was wearing reading glasses now to show the time of that and that's like what he ends the show on <laughs> i love john mulaney oh man so <laughs> So Marco is there, and we get a big full introduction to him again, which is former White Beer, Beer Pirates leader of the First Division ship doctor, Marco. That, that's a detail I don't think we had before. I don't think we knew he was the doctor. No, it makes perfect sense. He's may- the Phoenix. Regenerative powers. Exactly. There may have been something in one of the SBSs that mentioned this, so don't hit me up on that. Or don't hate add- me for that. No, I, I mean, don't hate me if I didn't know that detail. I'm just saying for the context of what we got in the story, I don't think they ever mentioned he was a, a medic before. And... All of these bratty old people are showing up. And they're like, I hurt. I ache. And he's like, okay. <laughs> I'll magic away, away all your your ailments. Yeah. Um, and then a little bit of time passes. And we see uh, Cat Viper and Marco sitting down to have a bit of a conversation. Uh, and Marco talks about, like, yeah, this village here. Uh, you know, Pops built this. And uh, fucking... <laughs> Bug. You can't Sorry. say Pops built this, and I can't Pops. not think of fucking Luke Cage right now. He's just like, Pops wouldn't want Pops. it like this. Oh, man. So, he you know, just talks and you know, reminisces with Cat Viper for a bit. Um, and uh, he says, you know, he actually created this village for, you know, there's these countries who can't join the world government because they're too poor to pay heavenly tributes. They're, you know, lawless islands as a result of that. They suffer from pirates and slavers. And when the country collapses, it creates a fresh generation of orphans. And Pops was one of them. He went to sea at a young age and became a pirate, but he always cared for this place and secretly pumped dirty money and supplies into it all throughout his life. He never had a family and his old friends are gone, but this island will always be his home. Well, you know, when you think about what you know about Whitebeard, that does all fit. You know, he treated all of his crew as if they were his own children. As like, well, sort of someone who grew up without a family it makes sense. So. Uh, I do like the little line that Cat Viper has here, which is, "In a dirty world, there's no good or bad money. It's just money." So, well, yeah. so as there is, you know, obviously, you know, Whitebeard died, but you know, we wanted to protect the village that he cared for so much. Blackbeard invaded. We started the grudge war against him. But with Pops' power at his command, we couldn't overcome Teach anymore, and he took everything. Um, 
And, you know, he starts to get choked up by just remembering, you know, just small little details about Whitebeard. Like, you know, he always, you know, took other people's drinks. He never paid the whole tab at a restaurant. But, you know, we always knew that he was putting his share of the treasure, all of it, into this place, doing it for such a selfless purpose. Um, you can't make me cry over Whitebeard again. I can't do it. So I, I'm, just, I just, I'm immune to your sweet, sweet words, Mark L. I just like this conversation no, because it's, it's you know sweet. sharing these little details, like these very you know specific things about him. That and it, it does really feel like he and Marco were very close. Oh yeah, absolutely. Then they bring up Weevil, uh, the guy who claims to be Whitebeard's son, and they're like, I don't really know, and you know, maybe they're trying to get some sort of an inheritance. In which case, there is none. <laughs> But he does admit, you know, Weevil's mother, Buckin, she was a former pirate. And, you know, 30 some odd years ago, maybe 40 years ago, she would have been on the same ship as Pops. So, hmm, maybe, maybe, maybe. So that does lend a little bit more credence to her claims, though, that uh, Weevil is his son. It's kind of interesting. We haven't heard of Bet Weevil in like a no. really long time. So Just since cool. his first appearance when he was wrecking shit. Yeah. Well, they mentioned him again where they mentioned I think he was officially made a, one of the warlords then. So it's been a bit, but yeah. And uh, so Marco says, hey, you know, if you're going to if you're going to meet up with Straw Hat Luffy after this, I've got a message to send along. You said he's going to want all right. And then cut. Got, oh, man. All right. Hold on. So I have to give ridiculous props to it because this is the coolest opening ever because this actually opens like a fucking Kabuki play where you hear someone playing like the dong, 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 like, and, the, and there's a fucking curtain that opens to the setting behind it. That shit's so fucking dope. I want this to be animated now so I can watch this. <laughs> Fuck, that's dope. Oda has been waiting to do this. You just know it because there are so many little things in this. You can tell that he really wanted to just draw the straw hats as people in, you know, the Edo period. <laughs> so let's meet the straw hats all over again, shall we? Well, First I off. I just want to give one quick thing. The two page spread is incredible. Like the sight of Wano is so cool and interesting. Like it's exactly what you'd imagine. Like a oh, Wano, like the land based off of Japan would kind of look like aesthetically, but he still adds these really cool, crazy elements like this huge bridge and this weird that bridge. You have tree. to start off at an 80 degree angle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I'm hoping there are stairs. Otherwise you're like climbing like, ah! Ah! <laughs> why? Why does everything require the bridge to get to? <laughs> the bridge goes everywhere, even to things on, the, on that are perpendicular to it. <laughs> I love the tree in the middle. The, oh, the, the great. building built on top of it, but then the branch of the tree loops over it. Yeah, I'm waiting for... Like, because when my mind sees this now, and I know that there's going to be a big arc in Wano... My mind is immediately trying to think, like, how does this scene get used in some mm -hmm. way when that happens? It's going to be something big. Oh, so <laughs> this is my favorite, honestly. <laughs> you start on you start off on too high of a note, Oda. <laughs> so the first one of the straw hats we see is Frank, who, first of all, his hair. <laughs> So he's working as a carpenter, naturally, and he's just working for a foreman there. And the foreman's like, hey, you new guy, is this your work up here? And he's like, you bet, boss, is there a problem? You bet there's a problem. It's perfect with a capital P. <laughs> I'm paying you a cat compliment, so take it. <laughs> the dude has nails that just float in the air around him. <laughs> like, they're not even in his teeth anymore. One of them's in his nose. <laughs> they're just flying. <laughs> And so Frank is like, of course it's her. I mean, thank you, boss. You can take her soul, coop. <laughs> and he's taken on the name of Frenosuke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Usopp is working as a medicine man. 
And he's like, come on, come on, step up and see my blade. Look, it's real. It cuts through paper. And look, with a mere touch, it splits the skin. He actually cuts an arm. But ah, a miracle before your eyes. With the simplest dab of my toad oil, it's permanently healed. No blood at all. And everyone's like, oh, I'll take some toad oil. Ah, yes. And he's a toad oil salesman. Usohachi. Not as, not as good as, as for no scam. I'm sorry. It still has its own charm, definitely. It does. Then, very weirdly, honestly, this Robin, one t- this one took me like a minute to remember who this was. I was like, was there another character I'm forgetting? Until I like finally took a look at the nose long enough and like realized the pun on the name. And I was like, oh, okay. So Robin is posing as a geisha. And not doing a particularly good job with her training as like the geisha mistress is trying to lead her and instruct her in her, da- in her dance. And she says, you'll never receive a summons from the Shogun's chamber in the short amount of time you want. Woo! And her name is Orobi. It's like, OK. Now, I think it's a little weird that it's like the one female member of the straw has this going geisha. <laughs> but when you think about it, it's like, OK, well. Wanted to get to the Shogun's chambers. I get it. Used I, to get into it. I wish, and this is probably the biggest problem I've always kind of had with Robin, is I wish her character was a bit more defined to the point where there would have been, like, a more obvious profession she could have taken up. Like, because, again, Robin always has, like, that weird gimmick where she's, like, obsessed with the macabre, or the macabre. so it would have been mm. interesting if we could have, like, made her, like, a witch doctor, but I guess that, yeah, like, that would, like, overlap too much of what Usopp's doing, mm. so it, it's an interesting sort of thing. Maybe like a creepy shrine maiden or something like something that. Something like that, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. This, this is something that it seems like it would be more up Nami's alley to do. Use her, you know, sex sex appeal in order to rob someone blind, you know, infiltrate their uh, residence and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But anyway, uh, we see uh, a flashback, a very brief one, honestly, uh, to Kinemon briefing everybody. You know, he's there... Um, I think that no, I don't see uh, Momonosuke anywhere there. Eh, he might not be there, but uh, the three samurai that were with the straw hats are there, and he's explaining like, okay, look, the Shogun of Wano is named Kurozumi Orochi, and he all of his officials have ties to Kaido, so they're arrogant, they're corrupt. But if you try and fight them directly, then that's going to catch Kaido's attention. So. We've got to not let anyone know that we're here until all of our allies get here. And then the preparations for battle can begin. So first, you must pass yourselves off as locals and quietly, quietly, Zoro, go about (laughs) your duties. (laughs) Which, like, that's a different thing, really, for the Straw Hats to do. We've seen them, you know, kind of run around disguised, but the playing the long game of like, you know, establish identities for yourselves and stuff. And presumably they've been undercover like this for like, I don't know, like a week or a couple of weeks by this point uh, is a different thing for them. And then we see what Zoro's been up to. <laughs> God damn it, Zoro. So there's people, you know, you know, chatting about the fact that all oh, his lordship, the magistrate has caught the Sujigiri. The rogue samurai will now be forced to commit seppuku. Thank goodness his reign of terror claimed three nighttime victims just this month. Oh, how I hate him. That terrible Sujigiri cut down my husband in his prime. And who is the Sujigiri? It's Zoro. Of course it's Zoro. Top not Zoro. Uh, uh, well, it's not Zoro, Nick. It's, I'm sorry, it's Zorojiro. <laughs> <laughs> I always forget that the, like, the Viz version has, is Zolo. It's Zolo, yeah. Zor- I think that Zoro Jiro kind of would flow a little better, but Zoro Jiro is very awkward and I kind of like it too. And so they're like, you are being forced to commit seppuku. Here, you know, take this. And also they accuse him of being the person who 23 years ago uh, killed uh, or not killed rather, but uh, was a grave robber. You know, in the midst of a pirate upheaval, we lost the remains of the legendary swordsman Ryuma and his blade Shusui. And so because he's been caught with uh, with Shusui, they're like, ah, you know, you must have taken this. They're like, you don't look like you were old enough to have been the grave robber at that time. But maybe you took this off of the thief at some point. And the match is like, ooh, pretty sword. Ooh. 
I do uh, like the touch too of that of rem- like remembering Ryoma mm-hmm. and the grave robbing and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I love this a little bit because Zoro is given you know a tiny little blade to commit seppuku with. And you know, for those of you who happen to not know, in seppuku, you know you've committed a grave crime, and so you're basically given a chance to repent for your sins and die with honor, which is you die in great suffering by disemboweling yourself and then there's an attendant right next to you who will end your suffering by chopping off your head so zoro is given this tiny little thing that's sole purpose is to just eh. and he's like hey this knife's got no hills <laughs> and they're like yeah it's designed that way so that you can only use it to kill yourself do you know how seppuku works <laughs> <laughs> and so Zara just like all right well so long <laughs> he takes his rope the top of his robe off and takes up the, the blade and the magistrate says i don't just just don't wear them blubber the samurai's true worth is in his end we have witnesses we have evidence this death gives you far more dignity than you deserve rejoice in your seppuku and uh the woman playing the uh Japanese guitar. I forget what it's called exactly. I know there's a special name for it, but it's got the weird pick and everything. It's the thing that Kubo plays in that movie that everyone liked, but I didn't really care for. Um, and uh, she was strumming as the, you know, tension ramps up and Zorov takes up the blade and he says, I can smell blood. And it says, you're the killer. And he does a Zoro and launches a giant shockwave across the entire court, separating him from the magistrate. And a you know, cut appears not only on him, but messes up the roof above him as well. And they're like, holy crap! <laughs> so his cover is blown now. But honestly, what a kick-ass way for Zoro to come back. <laughs> It is very, very cool. That I love it when inter- like they take the idea of like what a swordsman can do and they like break it down to show how cool Zoro and like other swordsmen are that like he does it with less. Like one of my favorite like moments of One Piece is when he's fighting Hachi and he doesn't have any swords and he still uses one of his three sword style <laughs> techniques. Yeah. He like uses Z- a tornado. <laughs> yeah, he's like zero sword style. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. So Wow, what an introduction to this new arc of One Piece. Uh, it caught me a little off guard, but when you think about the note that we left off on, I guess you no know, leaving out a moment of tension there and then just coming back to it later is a good choice. And hey, we're, we've arrived at, at the Wano arc, and uh, things are looking really cool right away, so I'm into it. Now, we'll see if this is actually the start of the Wano arc or not, because if I recall correctly, there was like a weird point when we were still like finished up Dress Rosa where we saw a glimpse into what was going on with Zhao, or Zoa, and was like Sanji and his group being chased by members of that group that we never really. That's kind of true. That's true. So there was like that mid glimpse there. So maybe that's what it this is. We're took, not actually it took about jumping. like two or three chapters, and then immediately went back. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we might just jump back to uh, the Reverie, or we may jump into what the Straw Hats are doing. I don't know, but uh, it, I love this. This chapter is great. Maybe not getting to full swing until Luffy and everyone else arrives potentially. But hey. Really good chapter. Uh, I, I dug this. I think that this is. Good. I'm pretty sure that this is my chapter of the week. Honestly, I think I'll just go ahead and do that straight up. All right. And uh, speaking of which, that's going to do it for Week of Manga Recap this week. Chris, what were your favorites this week? Uh, so my favorite chapter, I'm going to give it to One Piece off the bat, mm-hmm. and I, I'm debating on giving my character MVP to Zoro. But honestly, uh, on like the grand scale of things, I think I have to give it to Magma. From how just like hysterical that character, like I don't give a fuck about these guys, and then like Zeko's dead, <laughs> like just such a funny character. Like I, I, I love the guy from it, so I, I had a hard time not giving it to Zoro, but I, I, I I'm gonna give it back though. Thinking it over, I think that I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with you. I guess I will say that as like an honorable mention, I did like what we got from Megami, seeing her growth and stuff. But I also gave her props last week and magma did take me off guard with how funny he was this week uh also will mention that we never learned had a really nice uh, chapter i really love the moment with the fireworks going off behind the mystery girl's head to hide her view might uh, have to keep that one in mind for two page spreads at the end of the year yep all right and that's gonna do it everyone with the uh, two live readings in the books <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, thank you for joining us here on smashcast.tv slash rollot and twitch.tv slash rollot. Uh, we do live recordings uh, on Thursdays at somewhere between 7 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time currently, whatever. <clears throat> If you want to check out more Weekly Manga Recap, you can check out our past episodes on weeklymangarecap.podbean.com, as well as on our YouTube page and on iTunes. And uh, if you do all that stuff, be sure to give us likes and comments, and subscribe, all that stuff, so that you can help us to become kings of the hobby section and dethrone our rivals, the woodworkers. If you want to send us feedback, if you want to ask us a question for a Q&A episode, if you want to suggest a future manga for us to read... You can do all that stuff via email and send it to weekly manga recap at yahoo.com is the best place to do it. But also, we have a Discord server. Be sure to check that out. Uh, and if you do, there is a whole chat room just for leaving recommendations for us to check out. And there's all sorts of other stuff on there. There's My Hero Academia role playing. There's uh, lists of stuff that we've done before. There's discussions of ongoing series. All sorts of fun stuff. Manga related. Yep. And is that everything? I think that's everything. Special thanks to everyone for doing stuff on our Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com slash Weekly Manga Recap allows us to do all sorts of fun stuff for you guys. Create bonus content for you guys to enjoy. And, of course, we want to give a big shout out to the guys who helped make the podcast what it is. Zebra Stripe Hat, Infamous Planet, and... <laughs> very distracting. And Steve Manor, talk and artist. What's distracting about this, Nick? Explain it to uh, me. It's... No! <laughs> no! <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> All right. I think that that is going to do it then. All right, guys. We'll catch you next time right here on Weekly Manga Recap. Nick, let's have a very important discussion right now. Oh, very let's... serious discussion. Let's have a... Nick, the Industrial Revolution was neither industrial nor revolution. <laughs> One yes, it... yes, it was. <laughs> it was both. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>